Hey, Baker Babes. Back to James and the Giant Peach. Man, this book is good. And I was just talking, I was just at school this morning and Mr. Goins was saying how much he loves this book too. You'll have to talk to him about it after we come back from the summer, uh, after you've listened to me read the story. We're off, someone was shouting. We're off at last. James woke up with a jump and looked about him. The creatures were all out of their hammocks and moving excitedly around the room. Suddenly, the floor gave a great heave as though an earthquake were taking place. Here we go, shouted the old green grasshopper, hopping up and down with excitement. Hold on tight. What's happening, cried James, leaping out of his hammock. What's going on? The ladybug, who was obviously a kind and gentle creature, came over and stood beside him. In case you don't know, she said, we are about to depart forever from the top of this ghastly hill that we've all been trying that we've all been living on for so long. We're about to roll away inside of this great, big, beautiful peach to a land of, 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 to a land of, of what? Asked James. Never you mind, said the ladybug, but nothing could be worse than this desolate hilltop and those two repulsive ants of yours. Hear, hear, they all shouted. Hear, hear. You may not have noticed it, said the ladybug went on, but the whole garden, even before it reaches the steep edge of the hill, happens to be on a steep slope. And there, and therefore, the only thing that has been stopping this peach from rolling away right from the beginning is this thick stem attaching it to the tree. Break the stem, and off we go. Watch it, cried Miss Spider as the room gave another violent lurch. Here we go. Not quite, not quite. At this moment, continued the ladybug, our centipede, who has a pair of jaws as sharp as razors, is up there on top of the peach, nibbling away at that stem. In fact, he must be nearly through it, as you can tell from the way we're lurching about. Would you like me to take you under my wing so that you won't fall over when we start rolling? It's very kind of you, said James, but I think I'll be all right. Just then, the centipede stuck his grinning face through the hole in the ceiling and shouted, We've done it! We're off! We're off, the others cried. We're off! The journey begins, shouted the centipede. And who knows where it will end, muttered the earthworm. If you have anything to do with it, it can only mean trouble. Nonsense, the ladybug. We are now about to visit the most marvelous places and see the most wonderful things. Isn't that so, centipede? There is no, there is no knowing what we shall see, cried the centipede. We may see a creature with 49 heads who lives in the desolate snow. And whenever he catches a cold, which he dreads, he has 49 noses to blow. We may see the venomous pink spotted scrunch who can chew up a man with one bite. It likes to eat five of them roasted for lunch and 18 for its supper at night. There he is popping his head in there. You may see, we may see a terrible dragon and nobody knows that we won't see a unicorn there. We may see a terrible monster with toes growing out of the tufts of his hair. We may see the sweet little bitty bright hen, so playful, so kind and well-bred and such beautiful eggs. You just boil them and then they explode and they blow off your head. A new and a noceris, surely you'll see that the not enormous not, and normal gnat who stings? Who sting when it stings? You go in the knee, go in at the knee and comes out through the top of your hat. We may even get lost and be frozen by frost. We may die in an earthquake or tremor, or nastier still, we may even be tossed on the horns of a furious dilemma. But who cares? Let us go from this horrible hill. Let us roll. Let us bowl. Let us plunge. Let's go rolling and bowling and spinning until we're away from old Spiker and Sponge. One second later, slowly, insidiously, oh, most gently, the great peach started to lean forward and steal into motion. The whole room began to tilt over and all the furniture went sliding across the floor and crashed against the far wall. So did James and the ladybug and the old green grasshopper and Miss Spider and the earthworm. Also, the centipede who had just come slithering quickly, quite quickly down the wall. Outside in the garden, at that very moment, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker had just taken their places at the front gate, which or each with a bunch of tickets in her hand, and the first stream of early morning sightseers was visible in the distance, climbing up the hill to view the peach. 
We shall make a fortune today, Ann Spiker was saying. Just look at all those people. I wonder what will be, I wonder what became of that horrid little boy of ours last night, Aunt Sponge said. He never did come back in, did he? He probably fell down in the dark and broke his leg, Aunt Spiker said. Or his neck, maybe, Aunt Sponge said, hopefully. Just wait till I get my hands on him, Aunt Spiker said, waving her cane. He'll never want to stay out of all night again by the time I finish with him. Good gracious me, what's that awful noise? Both women swung around to look. The noise, of course, had been, caught, that had been caused by the giant peach crashing through the fence that surrounded it. And now, gathering speed at every second, it came rolling across the garden toward the place where Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker were standing. They ga gaped. They screamed. Ah! They started to run. They panicked. They both got in each other's way. They began pushing and jostling, and each of them was thinking only about saving herself. Aunt Sponge, the fat one, tripped over a box that she'd brought along to keep the money in and fell flat on her face. Aunt Spiker immediately tripped over Aunt Sponge and came down on top of her. They both lay on the ground, fighting and clawing and yelling and struggling frantically to get up again. Before they could do this, the mighty peach was upon them. There was a crunch, and then there was silence. The peach rolled on, and behind it, Aunt Sponge, and Aunt, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker lay ironed out on the grass as flat and thin and lifeless as a couple of paper dolls cut out from a picture book. And now the peach had broken out of the garden and was over the edge of the hill, rolling and bouncing down the steep slope at a terrific pace. Faster and faster and faster it went, and the crowds of people who were climbing up the hill suddenly caught sight of this terrible monster plunging down upon them, and they screamed and scattered to right and left and went hurling by. At the bottom of the hill, it charged across the road, knocking over a telegraph pole and flattening two parked automobiles as it went by, and then it rushed madly across about 20 fields, breaking down all the fences and hedges in its path. It went right through the middle of a herd of fine Jersey cows and then through a flock of sheep and then through a paddock full of horses and then through a yard full of pigs. And soon the whole countryside was a seething mass of panic-stricken animals stampeding in all directions. The peach was still going at tremendous speed with no sign of slowing down. And about a mile farther on, it came to a village. Down the main street of the village it rolled with people leaping frantically out of its path right and left. And at the end of the street, it went crashing right through the wall of an enormous building and out the other side, leaving two gaping holes in the, brick, in the brickwork. This building happened to be the, a famous factory where they made chocolate. And almost at once, a great river of warm melted chocolate came pouring out of the holes in the factory wall. A minute later, this brown, sticky mess was flowing through every street in the village, oozing under the doors of houses and into people's shops and gardens. Children were wading in it up to their knees, and some were even trying to swim in it, and all of them were sucking it, sucking it, sucking it into their mouths in a great greedy gulp and sh shrieking with joy. But the peach rushed on across the countryside, on and on and on. I think I might do that with chocolate, too, just... On and on and on, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. Cow sheds, stables, pigsties, barns, bungalows, hay racks, anything that got in its way went toppling over like a nine, nine pin. An old man sitting quietly beside a stream had his fishing rod whisked out of his hands as it went dashing by, and a woman called Daisy Entwistle was standing so close to it as it passed that she had the, then she had the skin taken off the tip of her long nose. Would it ever stop? Why should it? A round object will always keep on rolling as long as it is on a downhill slope. And in this case, the land sloped downhill all the way until it reached the ocean, the same ocean that James had begged his aunts to be allowed to visit the day before. Well, perhaps he was going to visit it now. The peach was rushing closer and closer to it every second and closer also to the towering white cliffs that came first. These cliffs are the most famous in the whole of England, and they are thousands of feet tall. Below them, the sea is deep and cold and hungry. Many ships have been swallowed up and lost forever on this part of the coast, and all the men who were in them as well. 
The peach was now only a hundred yards away from the cliff. Now fifty, now twenty, now ten, five. And when it reached the edge of the cliff, it seemed to leap up into the air, up into the sky, and hang there, suspended for a few seconds, still turning over and over in the air. And then it began to fall down, 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 down. It hit the water with a colossal splash and sank like a stone. But a few seconds later, up it came again, and this time up it stayed, floating serenely upon the surface of the water. At this moment, the scene inside the peach itself was of indescribable chaos. James Henry Trotter was lying bruised and battered on the floor of the room amongst the tangled mass of centipede and earthworm and spider and ladybug and glowworm and old green grasshopper. In the old his whole history of the world, no travelers had ever had a more terrible journey than these unfortunate creatures. It had started out well with much laughing and shouting, and for the first few seconds as the peach had begun to roll slowly forward, nobody had minded being a tumbled around a bit. But when it went bump and the centipede had shouted, that was Aunt Sponge, and then bump again, and that was Aunt Spiker, there had been a tremendous burst of cheering all around. But as soon as the peach rolled out of the garden and began to go down that steep hill, rushing and plunging and bounding madly downward, then the whole thing became a nightmare. James found himself being flung up against the ceiling and then back into the floor and then sideways down the wall and then up under the ceiling again and then up and down and back and forth and around and around. At the same time, all the other creatures were flying through the air in every direction. And so were the chairs and the sofa, not to mention the 42 boots that belonged to Centipede. Everything and all of them were being rattled around like peas inside an enormous rattle that was being rattled by a bad giant who refused to stop. To make it worse, something went wrong with the glowworm's lighting system and the room was in pitchy darkness. There were screams and yells and curses and cries of pain and everything kept going round and round. And once James made a frantic grab at the, some thick bars sticking out from the wall only to find that they were a couple of the centipede's legs. Let go! shouted the centipede, sticking him, kicking himself free, and James was promptly flung across the room into the old green grasshopper's horny lap. Twice he got tangled up in Miss Spider's legs, a horrid business. And toward the end, the poor earthworm, who was cracking himself like a whip every time he flew through the air from one side of the room to the other, coiled himself around James's body in a panic and refused to unwind. Oh, it was frantic and a terrible trip. But it was all over now, and the room was suddenly very still and quiet. Everybody was beginning to slowly and a little painfully disentang dis disentangle himself from everybody else. Let's have some light, shouted Centipede. Yes, they cried. Light, give us some light. I'm trying, answered the poor glowworm. I'm doing my best. Please be patient. They all waited in silence. Then a faint greenish light began to glimmer out of Glowworm's tail, and this gradually became stronger and stronger until it was, there was any way to, en anyway, enough to see by. Some great journey, the centipede said, limping across the room. I shall never be the same again, murmured the earthworm. <laughs> Nor I, the ladybug said. It's taken years off my life. But, my dear friends, cried the old green grasshopper, trying to be cheerful, we are there. Where, they asked. Where? Where is there? I don't know, the old green grasshopper said, but I'll bet it's somewhere good. We're probably at the bottom of a coal mine, said the earthworm gloomily. We certainly went down, 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 down very suddenly at the last moment. I felt it in my stomach. I still feel it. Perhaps we're in the middle of a beautiful country full of songs and music, the old green grasshopper said. Or near the seashore, said James eagerly with lots of other children down on the sand for me to play with. Pardon me, murmured the ladybug, turning a trifle pale. But am I wrong in thinking that we seem to be bobbing up and down? Bobbing up and down, they cried. What on earth do you mean? You're still giddy from the journey, the old green grasshopper told her. You'll get over it in a minute. Is everybody ready to go upstairs now and take a look around? Yes, yes, they chorused. Come on, let's go. I refuse to show myself out of doors in my bare feet, the centipede said. I have to get my boots on again first. 
Oh, for heaven's sake, let's not go through all that is that nonsense again, said Earthworm. Let's all lend the centipede a hand and get it over with, said the ladybug. Come on. So they did, all except Miss Spider, who had set about weaving a long rope ladder that would reach from the floor up to a hole in the ceiling. The old green grasshopper had wisely said that they must not risk going out of the side entrance when they don't know where they were but must first of all go up to the top to the peach and have a look around. So half an hour later, when the rope ladder had been finished and hung and the 42nd 40 second boot had been laced neatly on a centipede's 42nd foot, they were all ready to go out. Amidst the mounting excitement and shouts of, here we go, boys, the promised land, I can't wait to see it. The whole company climbed up the ladder one by one and disappeared into a so dark, soggy tunnel in the ceiling that went steeply, almost vertically, upward. Hmm, what are they going to find in chapter 18? I guess we'll find out tomorrow. Bye, guys.